this message hit me really hard coming from my background. <clears throat> I always believed that Jesus was created and I came to understand that he was not created, he was begotten. And that's what we're going to, going to talk about this afternoon, the fact that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God. And the thing is, when I talk to people of many denominations, I, being in the business that I'm in, I have contact with a lot of people every day, and I have an opportunity, because I'm self-employed, my boss allows me to speak about the gospel. <laughs> and he can be hard to work for, though, but being self-employed, it allows me to be able to speak to people, and that's what I love more than anything, is sharing the truth of God's word with folks. And in doing that, I shared yesterday that there have been people from every type of background that you could imagine that I have spoken to, from different denominations, Christian denominations, and every one of those denominations believe something about the Godhead that I don't. They believe that the Father and the Son and the co Holy Spirit are co-eternal, co-equal. The three are one God. But when I've presented this message to them, and it's going to be a little different today because I have PowerPoint, but when I've presented this message to them, including pastors from other churches, they recognize that there is something flawed in their understanding. They have, none of them have said to me, well, that's preposterous. That's just absolutely ridiculous. Now, I have to admit, I've gotten that from my own church, but I've never received that from anyone else that I've talked to. I had a Baptist pastor say to me about a month ago, I just wanted to share this briefly before I get started. When I shared what I believe with him from the Bible and he saw it, he said to me, I've been teaching a doctrine of Babylon. So he has some things to think about and he said that. I have to think about some things before I can move forward in my church. Well, fortunately, his church isn't that far from where I live, so I'm hoping that we will get together again very soon. I'm going to pursue that conversation. And the other thing is it comes up always when we talk about this. Whenever this topic comes up, it seems like a person will inevitably say that God is a mystery. How can we know him? How can we understand him? He's incomprehensible. He's mysterious. He's a mystery. And then I'll hear them use the words, he's, it's, there's the mystery of the Trinity. Have you ever heard that? The mystery of the Trinity. Well, that's why I want to take just a few moments to share with you this study. I believe that God can, as an infinite being, he has the capability of revealing himself to finite people. And I believe that's what he's done through his word, the Bible. That's what I believe he did when he sent his son here. Now, I, I want to set the record straight. I do believe that we'll be learning about God for eternity. There are things we will never know, but he does help us to understand who he is and who his son is. And I'd like to begin with a text in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. Colossians 2, 1. It says, and this is Paul. He's speaking to the church in Colossae, and he says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. Where? Laodicea. Who is the Laodicean church? It's the end time church. That's us. And again, for the record, I want to make this clear. This is not a denomination. Laodicea doesn't come with a den denominational label. It does not. This is God's end time church. People from all backgrounds, from all walks of life. So he says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for many as, as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the what? The full assurance of understanding. The full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, wait a minute. The word mystery seems to be something we can't understand. When you think of a mystery, it's mysterious. You, you can't comprehend it. But is that what this verse is saying? 
it says to the full it says to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God both of the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge so according to this this means that God should not be a mystery to us would you agree does this mean that he's a mysterious Trinity I think not the, the thing that I did was I did a comprehensive study on the word mystery, and I'm not going to share it all with you, but I want to go through some of these verses. The word mystery appears in the Bible 22 times, and every time it appears, it's in the New Testament in the form that we're seeing here, and in any form for that matter. 22 times. I want you to notice some of these. Mark chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the what? the mystery of the kingdom of God so in this sense the mystery it looks like is being revealed because it says that you can know the mystery it's been given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God the next text is Romans eleven twenty five. Paul says for I would not brethren that ye should be ignorant of this mystery lest ye should be wise in your own conceits you see he's saying that you shouldn't be ignorant you should know. You should understand. We should know. Romans chapter 16. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Wait a minute. The revelation of the mystery. What's the word revelation mean? It means revealing. So it shows here that there's going to be a revealing of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. This will be revealed. We will understand. We will come to know. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Again, we see that the wisdom of God, it says we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's mysterious to those who aren't studying. It's mysterious to those who don't understand. But isn't anything that way? If I don't understand something or how something works, if I have a device and I don't realize how it works, it can be kind of, kind of mysterious to me. But if we analyze it and we look at it and we get the Bible out and we study it, we can come to know this mystery. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Paul's revealing it. We shall not all sleep. Ephesians 1, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery. You see, you see a pattern? We're seeing a pattern. It's, this mystery is being revealed. We can understand it. Again, Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Again, we have this revealing of the mystery. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4, if you, if you want to take notes. I'm going to try to say every verse that we're looking at. Ephesians 3, 9. We're not going to, going to read them all the way through. But just to give you an idea of the meaning. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. We, every time that it's used. Again, in Ephesians 5, 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He's not saying it's something that we can't know. Christ is someone that we can know. Amen. Ephesians 6.19 is another text that says, right at the end, you can see it there, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, the mechanism behind how we're saved, I don't know how God does it. But we understand the plan of salvation. It can be revealed to us. This is what we are to take to everyone. We need to evangelize the world, not just the church. Again, we see Colossians 1, 26 and 27. We've heard a lot about this in the last couple of days. Even the mystery which hath been from, hit, had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So the mystery is made known to the saints. Who are the saints? We are. God's church. God's people. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. We're supposed to take it to everyone. Amen. And what is that mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we heard some wonderful ser sermons on this. It's not a mystery. It can be known. 
Colossians 4.3, again, we see the mystery mentioned. We see it again in, in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. I don't want to take a whole lot of time on these texts because there's so much to go through. 1 Timothy 3.9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. 1 Timothy 3.16 we're talking about a mystery again. And it's interesting if you do a study on the mystery of godliness. I'm going to encourage you to do that on 1 Timothy 3.16. It's very interesting. Try to do that in your personal study. We need to be studying the word of God. Again, Revelation 1.20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. Is so Laodicea to see one of the seven churches? Yes. Revelation 10, 7. Again, we see the mystery of God should be finished. We should know it. We can know it. Revelation 17, 5. We see the word mystery again. Revelation 17, 7. We see the word mystery again. Now, that you just saw all 22 times in the New Testament that the word mystery appears. And the word mysteries appears three times. And here they are. You see Matthew 13, 11, Luke 8, 10, and then we have it again in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2. Now, I want you to look at the word mystery in the Greek. The word mystery in Greek. It's a word musterion. I think that's how you say it. It looks that way phonetically, doesn't it? And it says, from a derivative of another Greek word, which I have no idea what that is, but I did call a friend of mine who understands the Greek, and he gave me some neat insight on this. And notice it says, a secret or mystery through the idea of silence imposed by initiation into religious rites. And I have to be honest, the first time I read that, I didn't understand it. I didn't get it. But he said, my friend said to me, look, this Greek word along that is mystery, along with the other Greek word that is, this is a derivative of, he said, is the idea of the ceremonies that only a few know about. And he used this illustration. He asked me, how many people survived the ark or the flood of Noah's day? And there were only a few. Now, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was telling as many as possible about this, but only a few heeded the word. Jesus Christ said that the, the road to life is what? Narrow. It's narrow and it's cramped, isn't it? It's crowded. And only a few find it. But the road to death or destruction is broad and spacious. So the thing is, the, the mystery is to those who are not studying. This is not a mystery. It's not something that's mysterious. And when speaking about the Father and Son, many of us say that this is a mystery. They call it the mystery of the Trinity. Well... The question is, how can we understand the Father and the Son? And I want to ask this. Is Jesus co-eternal with the Father? What's the Bible teach? What does the Bible say? Does it say anywhere that he's co-eternal with the Father? In other words, there's no time. They've both always existed. That's what, that's what co-eternity means. It means they have both always existed. But is that what the Bible is teaching? The Bible gives us a pattern and our brother Adrian would call it a divine pattern. And I always like to begin in Genesis. As anybody that has studied with me knows that I, everything in the Bible, I try to see if there's a root. I go back to Genesis, to the beginning, so we can get a good understanding of things. All of the truths that we believe today as Christians can be found in Genesis, believe it or not. And I believe that all of the teachings of the gospel can be found in Genesis. So take a look at Genesis 1.26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, I've had friends of mine tell me, Well, this was all three of them. This was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaking, and they all spoke at the same time. I'm sorry, I can't accept that. I can't find that anywhere in Scripture. When it says, then God said, let us make man in our image, I believe this was the Father speaking to his Son. Amen. And I believe if you heard Brother Limford's sermon this morning, he made it very clear that the Father is the source and the Son is the channel. So how are we made in the image of God? 
I get that a lot. How, how are we made in God's image? I want you to take a look at some of these texts here and just see if you get an image in your mind. You notice it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? I highlighted arm for you. Because when you think of an arm, does something come to your mind? Automatically, our mind thinks about an arm. Has the Lord's arm been shortened? The next one, we see his hand. I'm not going to read all of these texts. You can write them down. Isaiah 40, verse 2. It talks about the hand of the Lord. In Luke 11:20, 20, Jesus says, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. So we have an arm, a hand, and fingers. Are we seeing an image? We're beginning to see an image, aren't we? We go on. Psalm 11.4 talks about the eyes of God, his eyelids. If he has eyes, he must have eyelids. We're made in his image. We have eyes and eyelids. We have a hand and arm. We have fingers. We see the ears of the Lord in 1 Samuel 8.21. When we look at Matthew 4.4, 4, remember when Satan was tempting Jesus? He said, cast these, turn these stones into words, or into bread. He said, turn these stones into bread. Jesus quotes scripture. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of what? The mouth of God. God has a mouth. He speaks. Hopefully we can hear him. Ezekiel 38, 18, we see in the American Standard Version, it uses the word nostrils. He has nostrils. He must have a nose. We look and we see Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. He sits on a throne. He has hair on his head that's like pure wool. It's white, which indicates purity. And we're talking about the Father here because it says the Ancient of Days. That's the Father. That's Daniel 7, 9. Exodus 33, 20. You, you might remember this. Moses wanted to see the face of God, didn't he? He wanted to see his face, and God said... Thou, canst, thou cannot see my face and live. No, no man can. And you remember what God did? He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I know you want to see me. I'm going to put you in the crag of the rock, and I'm going to cover you with my hand. And then when I go by, you'll see my back parts or my hind parts. But my face you shall not see. Now, I know the Bible says that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Have you heard that? Look here, 1 Samuel 13, 14. God has a heart. He has a heart. So that brings me to the question, does it go any further than that? Remember I said God is a spirit, and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth? Does that mean that he doesn't have a form? Does that mean that he's not material of some sort? I don't think so, because all of these verses that we just looked at show that we are created in his image, and in a literal sense, I believe that could be the case. That's what the Bible is revealing to me. Now, I do know that God is a spirit, and whenever we think of a spirit, we automatically think, well, that's invisible. There's no way anyone could see a spirit. But the angels are spirits, aren't they? You think the angels can see one another? Sure. I think they can. The Bible tells us in Revelation that we shall see the face of God. How are we going to see him if he's not real? If he's not a real being? So how else are we made in the image of God? You have an image in your mind right now? How else are we made in the image of God? Let's take a look at a text here. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and I shared this with you yesterday. This is kind of neat to me because this was the first text I was ever taught to memorize as a child. And I could cite this by the time I was probably six. I knew it very well. But the fruit of the Spirit, you covered this this morning, brother. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Where does the Spirit come from? It comes from God. We're created in the image of God. He has given us these, this fruitage of the Spirit. If we bear this fruitage, we become more Christ-like. 
Is that right? If we bear this fruitage, we're more like Christ. We're becoming, as we bear that fruit, we're more in the image of God than we were when we were sinners. And we're still sinners. But the more we bear that fruit, the more we become like our Heavenly Father and like His Son. And the interesting thing about this is this separates us, I believe, from the animal kingdom tremendous, tremendously. Being made in the image of God separates us tremendously from the animal kingdom and particularly these fruits that we bear. And I use this illustration. I don't know if you liked it or not, but I, it's, it's appropriate, I think. You know, animals are driven by instinct. You and I have intellect that the animals don't have. And if you have two dogs, a male and a female, and one, uh, the male has not been neutered and the female hasn't been spayed, when it's mating time, that male dog will do whatever it can to get to the female because that's the way he was created. He wants to, he doesn't know why, but he's driven to that female dog and he wants to procreate. He doesn't realize that's what he's doing, but this is the way they were created. But we have a fruitage, we should, if we have Christ in us, called self-control, where we can control what we do and we can, we can, with the help of God, we can stop and not do something. If we're put in a position where we shouldn't be doing something or committing a certain act, we have the fruitage of the Spirit. We have God's Spirit that can help us to not do that. I believe this is another way we're made in the image of God because He can dwell in us through that Spirit. Let's continue. Is that, does it stop there? We said we're made in the image of God physically, perhaps. We're made in the image of God because we can exercise the fruitage of the Holy Spirit. But how else are we made in the image of God? Let's take a look at a text. We're going to go back to Genesis once again. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. You got a picture in your mind? Can you imagine this happening? Adam, it's, it's almost like he's laid out on a surgical table and God opens up his flesh and he takes a rib. And the rib in verse 22, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So you see this image? Think about this. Verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall what? Become one flesh. Now, wait a minute. Does that mean just one person? No, the two become one in unity, one in purpose. You know, when Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, if you look at that in the Hebrew language very carefully, it means that he was the, she was the very substance of Adam. His very substance. She came out of him. You and I came out of a woman. Eve came out of a man. That's amazing to me. That's miraculous. You know, that is in the image of God. And we're going to look at that now. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Now, I get all of the time when I share this with, and I've shared this with people who I consider scholars and theologians and pastors that I know very well, and they all tell me that Proverbs 8 is the wisdom chapter, and I, I agree. But Proverbs has a lot more here than just wisdom, the attribute of wisdom. And I want you to follow this carefully because Proverbs 8, verse 1, it says, Does not wisdom cry out? So we're speaking of wisdom. And it continues talking about wisdom. And then it, it reiterates it again in verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I'm reading from the New King James. Forgive me for that. But because I evangelize a lot, I try to speak in the New English that people understand. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. So still, it's wisdom speaking in verse 12. The interesting thing is, when you get to verse 22, there's a change in understanding of who is speaking. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. Let's take a look. Proverbs 8, verse 22 and 23. 
It says, the Lord, that's Yahweh or Jehovah. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. I have been established. Whoever this is speaking said, I have been established. Let's look at that word in Hebrew. The word established in Strong's, it means to pour out, especially a libation or to cast, like casting metal, to cover, to melt, to offer, to cause to, to pour out, to set up. Now, if something was, was established, that means that there was a time that it wasn't established. I use the illustration of this building. If this building was established in 2013, where was it in 2011? It wasn't here. So the other point is to cast metal or to pour out. It's, have you ever seen a mold? Have you ever seen how metal sometimes is casted? Sometimes they have a mold and they pour it in. Keep that in your mind. To come out of or to pour out, to melt, to offer, to cast. When you take a mold and you cast something and you take the mold away, isn't it just like the mold? It's just like the mold. It's a replica. Okay? Let's continue. Proverbs 8, we're going, to start at, we're going to start again in Proverbs 8, verses 24 and 25. The same being is speaking. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the, the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Now, first of all, let's establish, could this be wisdom? It can't. Look, the Father has always been. There was never a time when the Father was not. Never a time. And as long as, because the Father is eternal and He has been around forever, wisdom has had to be around forever. I don't believe wisdom is an attribute that God acquired. I think I said this before. A friend of mine says, God doesn't sit there and say, you know, it just occurred to me. And He used the... He used a little thing. It's really funny. He says, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? That's amazing to me because God is infinite. So it could not be an attribute. The other thing about it, this, this brought forth, and this, I appreciate our, my brother Linford helping me with this because I had a couple of wrong citations when I gave this yesterday. And, um, you know, I'm constantly learning, friends. And if I ever mislead from here, I will always try to correct it. And, and I apologize for the mistake yesterday. It's been a blessing. There are only four times in all of Scripture that this phrase is used. You're looking at two of them right here. This word brought forth. And the interesting thing is it has the same Hebrew meaning in the other two texts. It's the same Hebrew verbiage. Let's take a look. One of them is, if I can get my slide to move forward. There we go. Psalm 51, 5. It says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, wait a minute. I was brought forth in iniquity. What does that mean? I was brought forth. You notice the next sentence, In sin my mother conceived me. Would you say this is talking about a birthing process of some sort? Being born? It sounds that way. We look at the next time it appears, it's Job 15, verse 7. I guess it would have been in Job first because Job was written before the Psalms. I'll, I'll reverse those. Are you the first man who was born? Or were you, in the New King James, it uses the word made before the hills. What's it say in the King James, brother? In, in Job 15, 7, it doesn't use the word made. It, you, you told me. What is the word there? Born. Born. Is that what it says? King James is made also. Okay. So, but what are you reading there? Are you in Job 15, 7? 15, 7. It says, are you the first man who was born or were you made? Is that the word made? Yeah. Okay. It's the same Hebrew word as brought forth. For some reason here, it's, it's so you, we could say, or were you brought forth before the hills? If we were to read it exactly as it reads. Brother? Uh, 
American Standard Version says brought forth. Very good. I appreciate you pointing that out. So, and that's the 1905 version of the American Standard. Very good. I do have a copy of that Bible. It's a very nice translation. So let's go back to this text. Proverbs 8. I want you, we're going to go back to the beginning. Okay? A little repetition here. Proverbs 8, beginning in verse 22. Remember what we said. Being, what being established mean, means and being brought forth means coming forth from or coming out of. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, starting in Proverbs 8.22. Before his works of old, I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. i got to stop there. The primal dust of the world in the Hebrew means the smallest particulate. Even on a molecular level, a rabbi told me that, even down to the molecular level. How did they know that back when they, did they know what a molecule was? It's amazing what, the, what inspiration does to these men, the things that they can write and the meaning that it had, especially when you get into the original language, like knowing that the earth was suspended upon nothing. How did they know that back then? It had to be God's inspiration. So again, it says, While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then, or at that time, I was beside him as a master craftsman. The master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Who is the master craftsman? It's Christ Jesus. Amen. It is Christ Jesus. Proverbs 8, 22 through 31 clearly cannot be speaking of the attribute of wisdom, but speaking of wisdom personified in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's Jesus himself speaking. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? I literally get goosebumps when I talk about this. It's beautiful to me. Now, the next question that people ask me whenever I present this is, are you saying that Jesus was created? Was Jesus created? Is that what I'm saying? Let me be clear. No, I am not saying Jesus was created. Not at all. We cannot believe that. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. If He's the begotten Son of God, that means that He came forth from the Father. Not created, but begotten. We're going to talk more about that word begotten. Nowhere does the Bible teach that Jesus was created. In all of my life, I was taught this. Growing up, I was taught that Jesus was created. But in the last three years, I've come to the understanding that Jesus was not created. And I praise God for that. And I believe that God has put Rick and Mary in my life for that very, for many reasons, but for that one especially, I came to understand that. As we talked about this message back and forth, Rick gave his testimony yesterday. Um, it was amazing because they were trying to convince me for how long? Two years? That God was a, a trinity. Well, in that conversation, I learned a lot. And I learned that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God, not created but begotten. Amen. And they came to understand that Jesus is a literal Son. Amen. Praise the Lord. Isn't it amazing how He works and He brings us together? So let's prove scripturally that Jesus was the one who was brought forth and was the master craftsman. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, says, Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood. That's the blood of Christ and forgiveness of sins. He is what? The image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
Beautiful. The image of the invisible God. We saw that imagery in the Old Testament. When we look at Jesus, we can see the image of God himself. The firstborn. Colossians 1.16, still talking about Jesus. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created, what? Through him and for him. This goes along with 1 Corinthians 8, 6. That's the of whom, by whom text, am I right? These texts and others show that the Father did not create himself. He created through Christ Jesus. That's beautiful. Through his Son, he created everything. Whether angels, it doesn't matter what it is. Even the primal dust, Christ Jesus created by means of the Father. The source and the channel. The Father is the source, Christ Jesus is the channel. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose what? Goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Whose goings forth, in the Hebrew language, just literally means of family descent. And it has a root meaning right here. Strong's, a going forth. That is the act, an egress. Have you ever heard that word egress? I had to look that up. Egress means the act of going out of. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. The act of going out of. An exit, it says. Notice it says, hence, a source. A source. Who's going forth. So there's a source for the one who is going forth. Amen. It says, brought out. Bud, that which came out. Going forth. Are you getting the point? Very interesting to me. Let's go back to Micah 5, 2. We talked about the goings forth. What, what about from everlasting? Boy, I get this a lot. From everlasting. He never had a beginning. He's always existed. That's what the Bible's teaching. Right there, it says from everlasting. Well, when you look at from everlasting in the Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word, olam, olam. This means time out of mind. It does not mean no beginning or no or origin. Time out of mind. Sometimes so far back we can't even imagine. We are told that Jesus created not only this world, but other worlds in Scripture. He who created the worlds, it's a plural word. So for us to think that we're the only ones in the universe, I think that's pretty arrogant. Let's move along. John 1.1, 1, 1. this can be a controversial text. And I've changed this a little bit from yesterday because I've learned a few things about this, which is good. Man, iron sharpens iron. I'm constantly learning. Constantly learning. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This can be a confusing text to some. And a lot of, them, a lot of people will use this to say, see, there you go. There it is. The Word was God. Jesus was God. There's no difference. The Father and the Son, they're, they're just, it's just a role they're taking on. They're, they're not a true, literal Father and Son. But that is not what this text bears out. When you really study it through and you take a look, if you look at this, this comes from a book called The Emphatic Diaglot. And um, a friend of mine has a copy of this. In fact, I called him before I came down to this camp meeting because I wanted to verify a couple of things. Mr. Coles is who I'm talking about. And he, he looked in his, he has this very publication, and he looked at it, and he says, well, you know, a lot of people are offended when it says, can you see it there? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and a God was the Word. And people go, oh, a God? Well, that, that might not be how we would want to understand that text. And I ask him, does that do any damage to our understanding of John 1.1? 1, 1? He says, not at all. Not at all. He says, if you understand the Greek language, all this is saying is that the word was divine. The word was divine. It's not saying there are two gods. There's one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. Amen. The Bible makes that clear over and over. 
So when we look at this, and I found this interesting, the, the Vatican manuscripts have translated it. You know, you know who the Vatican is, right? Look at how they translated this into English. In the beginning was the word, or the logos, and the logos was with God. You notice that God is all caps, like we would do Lord in the Old Testament. When we're speaking of Lord or Yahweh or Jehovah, it's all capitalized. Well, they, they separated it. Oh, thank you. And the logos was... You notice God there has the small O-D. They did that because they, even the Catholic Church recognized that there was a difference between the Father and the Son. But is this what they teach? No. So we have to be very careful. And there's a lot more that we could go into. In fact, if you want to read something about this, it's very, uh, a very good book on this topic, on John 1.1 1, 1, and on the being brought forth. Uh, Brother Beachy's book, uh, Understanding the Personality of God, on page 18, there's an excerpt in here. I don't have time to read it right now, but it's very good. You, you might want to take a look at that. It's right over on the table. Let's move along. John 1, 3. Again, we're establishing, this is talking about Jesus Christ. It says, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So anything that was made or created, Christ made. So he couldn't make himself. He could not be created. Here's another image of the Father and the Son. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you say, well, yeah, the Father spoke, right? We saw in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, that sound, like I said, that sounds confusing. Jesus was God by inheritance. He was God by inheritance. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Father spoke, the Word created. The Word comes out of your mouth. It's amazing that the Father can speak and His Son can create. It's just beautiful. And I, I found this picture. I just thought this was a nice little... You know, I can imagine the Father speaking and His Son doing the work. How proud was he? You know, I remember when I was a kid, my dad and I would work on projects together, and I know that when my dad would see me doing things and learning, he was proud of that. My dad was a mechanic. Guess what? I'm a mechanic. Like father, like son. Isn't that what the saying goes? Jesus was the hands-on creator, we could say. He was the one who had the actual task of doing what the father said. But we have another text which shows that he was not created, but came from the Father. Now, this is my understanding of this, and I don't want to read anything into it that's not there. I was going to delete this slide, but I thought I'd leave it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 is a text that I've known all of my life, which is talking about when the kingdoms of the world, coming to the, when the world's coming to an end, and you had the kingdom of Babylon there, or I'm sorry, you have on the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, he had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So it was the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron, and then the kingdoms. You remember that image? We're all familiar with that. We've studied Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, it talks about a time when the God of heaven would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed, but his kingdom would be established and stand forever. How's he going to do that? Who comes back? Jesus does. Yes, Christ Jesus. Look at Daniel 2.45. For as much as thou sawest that the... What? The stone. Who is the stone? Look at this text. Ephesians 2.20. Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. Are you seeing an image here? The chief corner stone. Let's go back to the text. Come on. It's working. There we go. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay. In other words, this stone, we can imagine it, we've seen the pictures, where it hits that image in the feet, and what's the image do? It just goes into dust. And then God's kingdom fills the earth, doesn't it? Is that what this text is saying? Are we seeing an image? The stone was cut out of the mountain. Could the Father be the mountain? 
When it says without hands, what does that mean? Without hands? How could that be? The stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Look at Hebrews 1.10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Hands denote creation. So for us to look at a text like Daniel 2.45 and say that this stone was cut out of the mountain without hands means that he was not created. He was begotten. Let me ask you, was Adam cut when the rib was taken from his side? It says God opened him up. Something happened. Did Eve come out of Adam? What I'm submitting to you is that Jesus Christ came out of the Father. Amen. The stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Not created. Not created, but begotten. The only begotten Son of the Most High God. Without hands means not created. We see this image that Jesus was begotten from the Father. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Can you get maybe a glimpse of it, that how we're made in the image of God? We also see that Jesus was the hands-on creator when we look at these texts. Now, we're going to take a glance at the word begotten, just as it applies to Jesus in Scripture. Now, there are many people that I've talked to that have this concept that only begotten means only unique. It means unique Son of God. But, you know... My friends and I, we've done a study on this. We can't find that anywhere. Let's take a look. Here we go. Here's one of the first times. Psalm 2-7. We read this earlier today. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Now we know that's a prophecy. And everybody says, well, that's pointing to the incarnation. Let's take a look at the word begotten first before we go on. The word begotten, it says a primitive root, to bear young, to beget, to act as a midwife, to bear, beget, birth, be born, bring forth, show lineage. Does it say anything about being unique? Nothing. I don't see anything, anything showing that it's unique. But to bring forth, to beget, to be born from, to come out of, goes right along with what the Bible teaches about Eve coming from Adam, and it goes right along with Proverbs chapter 8 about the Son of God coming out of His Father. That's powerful to me. Very powerful. Look at Hebrews 1.5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Look at the Greek for this word begotten, and then we're going to come back to this text because we need to talk about that for a moment. Begotten in the, in the Greek, to procreate. Hmm. To regenerate, to bear, to beget, to be born, to bring forth, to conceive, to be delivered, to spring from. Are you getting an image in your mind? The Greek word again goes right along with Proverbs 8, goes right along with Genesis chapter 1. This definition is almost exactly the same as it is in the Hebrew language. In the Greek and the Hebrew, they go hand in hand. Now, I want to go back and read verses 5 and 6 with this understanding that to bring forth or, or to be begotten means to bring forth or to come out of or to be born. Okay? Keep that in mind. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For unto which of the angels had he said at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. He never said that to the angels. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he's, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And I want you to notice that in the context of these two verses, and all of Hebrews chapter 1, if you take the time to read it and study it, this shows that Jesus was a son before he came to the earth. Would you agree? This is not simply a role. They are not actors. They are not role-playing as many churches want to believe. You have a literal father and a literal son. 
And this Greek word for first begotten, you notice I highlighted that for you. It literally means first born. It's that simple. It's that simple. Well, this brings up another question. I get this a lot. Well, does that mean that Jesus is co-equal with the Father? Is he co-equal? Let's take a look. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why? Well, the text answers that very question. If you look at Philippians 2, 9 and 10, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name. Wait a minute. Did it say he, he had the name? It was always his. He was given the name, which was above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow to the, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Let me illustrate it this way. I was talking to Linford earlier. He gave me this book. Can I, can I rob him of it? No. He gave it to me. It's, something, it's a gift. He gave this to me. It's mine to do with what I want. What I'm saying is that God has given his son equality. He's not co-equal. It came from the Father. Let's look at another text. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made, there it is, the worlds. The worlds. Remember I mentioned that earlier? So God did this through his Son, didn't he? Look at the next verse who being the brightness, Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So it says he's the express image of the Father. The express image. We said God's invisible. He's invisible to us now. But when we're glorified, we're going to see him. I look forward to that day. There's evidently a dimension there that we can't see. Hebrews 1 verse 4 says, Being made so much better than the angels, he hath by what? Inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus is a son of God a literal son of God. That's amazing. He obtained his name by inheritance. That means that sometimes when we look at his name in the Old Testament, when we see the name Jehovah, and we recognize it might be Jesus that's speaking, he inherited that name from his father. So we can understand that sometimes in the Old Testament when it uses the name Jehovah, it can be referring to the Son of God because He is the representative. He is our mediator. He is the means that God is using to communicate with people and to create. Romans 8.15 But ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So... He is a literal son, but we are sons how? By adoption. We are sons and daughters. We are adopted sons and daughters of God, but Jesus is the literal son of God. He was begotten of God. Jesus is divine because the Father is divine. He's the very substance of God. The very substance of God. I always like to look at this. You imagine Jesus getting baptized. You know, Jesus' baptism wasn't for himself because we talked about it earlier. Brother Linford's sermon just really moved me very much. I thought it was a powerful sermon this morning. 
And we talked about how we, we die to the old self when we come up out of that water, we're a renewed man. You see, when we're baptized, it's symbolic of our dying and our rebirth, isn't it? Remember Nicodemus? He talked to Jesus. He had a misunderstanding. When Jesus said, you need to be born again, oh, what am I, to crawl back into my mother's womb? No, you were misunderstanding, Nicodemus. Let me help you understand what we're talking about. You see, you and I, we're born in the flesh. We're born in sin. And then in order to be a partaker of this divine inheritance, this, this adoption by God, we die to ourselves. We accept Christ Jesus as our Savior. We come up out of the water born again. Right? Born in the flesh, then born again. Was Jesus born again? Yeah, amen. You know, I ask Christians that. They say, what? How could he be born again? It wasn't at his baptism. You see, Jesus was born from the, from the Father first. Jesus was born from the Father first. He is divine. But he was born again in the flesh from a woman. Eve came out of a man. And all of her children were born of a woman. Once from the Father, Jesus was born. He was born again in the flesh from a woman. Isn't that beautiful? To come here on our behalf, that's powerful to me. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, in verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great the precious prom and precious promises, that through these you may be what? Partakers of what nature? Divine. divine nature, not human nature, not sinful nature, but we can partake of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's amazing. We can be partakers of the divine nature because of Christ Jesus. We can partake of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. That's hard to comprehend, but it's so beautiful. Now, let's do a brief review. I just want to go back through what we've covered, just so you can settle this in your mind a little bit. And I may cover a point or two that I didn't cover so far. And I'm, I'm going to wrap this up here in just a few minutes. Man... Adam preceded Eve. Do you agree? Adam was here first. Eve came out of Adam. Now, now think about this for a moment. If Eve came out of Adam, if she was the very substance of Adam, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was the same DNA as Adam. You know, when people say to me that the father and son are co-eternal, it, it really disturbs me because I don't know of any son that's in here, all of, all of us men and women, sons and daughters, who are as old as your father. None of us have been around as long as our father. And I don't believe the father is an actor. I don't think that he, he is a role player, and I don't think the son is either. Again, we looked at Psalm 2-7. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Jesus is the literal begotten son of God. According to the Bible, he was begotten when? In eternity past. Time out of mind. Another point I'd like to make, make is found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse 33. It says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. That's interesting raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. These verses clearly show, friends, that Jesus was brought up, we could say, before his earthly existence. Isn't that what Proverbs said? As one brought up with me? And he was raised up again, like it says here, in his human existence. Also, we could say that Jesus was born from the Father in eternity past and born again at the Incarnation, right? We, we touched on that. This is just a review. Is it making sense? Are you seeing an image? You see how we're made in the image of God? It's beautiful. 
This actually shows us a type of our living perfectly in the flesh as born-again Christians. We can do it in Christ Jesus. We can, not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. It's really beautiful. Also, this language goes right along with the language that's used in Proverbs 8, verse 30, which says this. Then I was by him as one brought up with him. Right? We said he was brought up, and then he was raised up again. Brought up again. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Take a look at Genesis. We went back here. I'm going to go back to Genesis because I really want this to be clear in your mind. We are not saying that Jesus was created. Because I get this so much. Everybody says to me, well, you, don't, you believe that Jesus was created and you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Not true. I do believe in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep. This is Genesis 2, 21 and 22. And, he, and, and, this, and a deep sleep fell upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs. Remember we said that God took a rib from Adam and he brought forth the woman. We talked about the DNA. I believe that God took his very substance. I don't understand how it worked. But he brought forth his only begotten son. He came out of his father, born, the firstborn of all creation. That's what we're told. And we see here when Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh is my flesh. She was taken out of man. We said that this was the substance, right? Well, Jesus is the very substance of the Father, and I believe John 1.18 points this out. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Where's the bosom? Is this where my ribs are? Right here? The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. Christ Jesus came out of his Father. It's wonderful. When you have this concept and you recognize that Jesus is the divine Son of God, that He is God by inheritance, He is fully divine, He is right, we can worship Him. When we understand that and we recognize, like I did, this is a new truth to me because I believed He was created. So when I read things like all of the angels of God worship Him, that troubled me. But now I understand it. The scales have fallen away. And I thank God for that. And one other text we, we need to look at. One last one. Well, I've, I've got two. I'm sorry. That's just the way I am. Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. What did Jesus say in John 10.30? I and my father are one. You know, Eve was a human because Adam was a human. She had human nature because he was human nature. The son is divine because his father is divine. They're one in substance, one in nature, one in purpose. This is how they're one. One in unity. And a husband and a wife, this is the way we're supposed to be as husband and wife. It's a wonderful arrangement. Now think again about that imagery. Just think about it a little bit. And as you go home tonight, think about these things, that a son never precedes his father. A son is never as old as his father. So according to the study that we've done here today, which is a very brief study, we've established that Jesus is not co-eternal with the Father, and Jesus is not co-equal with the Father. He was given equality by the Father. Amen? The Father is the source of all. Jesus Christ is the channel through which the Father communicates and creates. It's beautiful. This was kind of offensive when I showed this before. I had a few gasps. I hear this all the time. The mystery of the Trinity. Yes, the Trinity is a mystery. It is, because it's not biblical. It doesn't come from here. We establish that the word mystery, every time it's used in the Bible, is something that can and is revealed. The Trinity is a mystery because it's a man-made doctrine. And if you have been taught this, I know and I understand how hard it is to change a belief. 
I fought tooth and nail when I first came to the truth about the Sabbath. I fought tooth and nail even though I saw it. I fought for 10 years to not have to understand it. I studied against it. And it wasn't until I read a book by a guy who was an ex-Sabbath keeping Christian. I read his book and I thought, how preposterous. I'm poking holes in what he's saying. This doesn't make a bit. A book against the Sabbath convinced me to keep the Sabbath. Isn't it amazing how God works? I couldn't believe it. So, instead of listening, listening to what you are told to believe by whatever denomination you may be a part of, listen to what God is saying. Open His Word. Study it. Read it. Don't believe it because somebody said it. You know, earlier I was talking with my brother Linford and and he said, look, I want you to see this. And it was one of the changes I made in my slide. He says, but don't believe it because I say it. You've got to look it up for yourself. Amen. I'm so glad to hear him say that because that's the way we study. This is how we need to do it. Jesus is the Son of God, not God the Son. In closing, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. This is our last text. Matthew 16. Thank you. Somebody did that for me. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. I didn't have time to put this in the PowerPoint. I guess I did, but I didn't take the time today to do it. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus was interested in what people thought, who they thought he was. Does it make a difference? You know, I hear this all of the time, too. Why is this important? Why is it important? You're studying this. What, what difference does it make? Well, it meant enough to Jesus that he wanted to know what people were thinking. And if we don't have Jesus right, and we don't have the Father right, and we don't have a clear understanding of the Holy Spirit, we're worshiping a false god. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14. Matthew 16, 14. So they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? These are the men that are walking with Jesus. He wanted to know what their opinion was. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He does not say you are God the Son. You are the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. God reveals himself. He makes himself understandable even to the finite, sinful human being. It's beautiful. So we can understand him and his only begotten Son. He's not a prankster. He's not an actor. He's not a role player. We have God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And hopefully we have the indwelling Spirit, which is Christ in you.